Listen and practice. Exercise 1. My travel journal. October 27. I went to a school party last Friday, and it was awesome. I talked with a Japanese man named Kenji and a Polish woman named Anna. We talked about our country's customs and our experiences in the States so far. We are going to walk around the city together this weekend. Also, Kenji wants me to write for the student newspaper here at school. Maybe things are getting better. October 27. October 27. I went to a school party last Friday, and it was awesome. I went to a school party last Friday, and it was awesome. I talked with a Japanese man named Kenji and a Polish woman named Anna. I talked with a Japanese man named Kenji and a Polish woman named Anna. We talked about our country's customs and our experiences in the States so far. We talked about our country's customs and our experiences in the States so far. We are going to walk around the city together this weekend. We are going to walk around the city together this weekend. Also, Kenji wants me to write for the student newspaper here at school. Also, Kenji wants me to write for the student newspaper here at school. Maybe things are getting better. Maybe things are getting better. My Travel Journal October 27 I went to a school party last Friday, and it was awesome. I talked with a Japanese man named Kenji and a Polish woman named Anna. We talked about our country's customs and our experiences in the States so far. We are going to walk around the city together this weekend. Also, Kenji wants me to write for the student newspaper here at school. Maybe things are getting better. My Travel Journal October 27 I went to a school party last Friday, and it was awesome. I talked with a Japanese man named Kenji and a Polish woman named Anna. We talked about our country's customs 
and our experiences in the state so far. We are going to walk around the city together this weekend. Also, Kenji wants me to write for the student newspaper here at school. Maybe things are getting better. Listen and practice. Exercise 2 During the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but we didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway, and we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month, because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> I dealt with park business and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife, and by making cuttings through the rock. Uh, nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area, with 50,000 visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park and makes sure the visitors are kept fed and watered, which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. During the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land and we decided to settle down and have children. During the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. Pretty soon we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but
We didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham and decided we could do a much better job. We didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway. And we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month. And we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month. Because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> Because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> I dealt with park business and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. I dealt with park business and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife. And by making cuttings through the rock. And by making cuttings through the rock. Nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area. Nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area. with 50,000 visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. With 50,000 visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly.
Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park. And make sure the visitors are kept fed and watered which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> and make sure the visitors are kept fed and watered, which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction. Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. Listen and practice. During the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but we didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway, and we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month, because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> I dealt with park business and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife, and by making cuttings through the rock. Uh, nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area, with 50,000 visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park and makes sure the visitors are kept fed and watered which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction. 
and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. Listen and practice. Exercise 3 I really miss my old friend Patrick. He's always been there for me, really supportive and a good listener. But I can't say we're really friends anymore, and it makes me sad. We just started to grow apart. We call each other less often and don't see each other much either, maybe once a month. I think it's my fault. Maybe I didn't work at our friendship enough and just assumed we'd always be friends. But I think you do need to work on your friendships. Otherwise, people grow apart. I don't know what to do about it. I could accept things like they are or possibly reach out to Patrick and try to make more time for him. I really miss my old friend Patrick. I really miss my old friend Patrick. He's always been there for me, really supportive and a good listener. He's always been there for me, really supportive and a good listener. But I can't say we're really friends anymore. But I can't say we're really friends anymore. And it makes me sad. And it makes me sad. We just started to grow apart. We just started to grow apart. We call each other less often. We call each other less often. And don't see each other much either. And don't see each other much either. Maybe once a month. Maybe once a month. I think it's my fault. I think it's my fault. Maybe I didn't work at our friendship enough. Maybe I didn't work at our friendship enough. And just assumed we'd always be friends. And just assumed we'd always be friends. But I think you do need to work on your friendships. But I think you do need to work on your friendships. Otherwise, people grow apart. Otherwise, people grow apart. I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what to do about it. I could accept things like they are. I could accept things like they are. Or possibly reach out to Patrick and try to make more time for him. Or possibly reach out to Patrick and try to make more time for him. I really miss my old friend Patrick. He's always been there for me really supportive and a good listener, but I can't say we're really friends anymore, 
and it makes me sad. We just started to grow apart. We call each other less often and don't see each other much either, maybe once a month. I think it's my fault. Maybe I didn't work at our friendship enough and just assumed we'd always be friends. But I think you do need to work on your friendships. Otherwise, people grow apart. I don't know what to do about it. I could accept things like they are or possibly reach out to Patrick and try to make more time for him. I really miss my old friend Patrick. He's always been there for me, really supportive and a good listener. But I can't say we're really friends anymore, and it makes me sad. We just started to grow apart. We call each other less often and don't see each other much either, maybe once a month. I think it's my fault. Maybe I didn't work at our friendship enough and just assumed we'd always be friends. But I think you do need to work on your friendships. Otherwise, people grow apart. I don't know what to do about it. I could accept things like they are or possibly reach out to Patrick and try to make more time for him. Listen and practice. Exercise 4 Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. And one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible. But at the same time, they wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping, south-facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, 
and it is possible that in future the house may even generate an electricity surplus and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood, and the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment, mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything, environmentally I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So, eco-housing like this is likely to become much more... Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. And one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, and one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible. But at the same time, they wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. But at the same time, 
They wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself, with two stories. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself, with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping, south-facing side was exposed to the light. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping, south-facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Now, what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors 
and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, and it is possible that in future the house may even generate an electricity surplus and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. In fact, and it is possible that in future the house may even generate an electricity surplus and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood. and the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds, which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds, which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment. mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. Mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. 
In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared, Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared, and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything environmentally, I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. Environmentally, I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So, eco housing like this is likely to become much more. Listen and practice. Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. And one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible. But at the same time, they wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping, south-facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, 
what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, and it is possible that in future the house may even generate an electricity surplus and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood and the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment, mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything, environmentally I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So, eco-housing like this is likely to become much more... Listen and practice. Exercise 5. Cell phone etiquette. The first point I'd like to address is when not to use your phone. It's polite to switch off your phone or turn off the sound when you're in class or in a meeting. If you get an important call, you should ask for permission to leave the room and then don't talk for too long. Furthermore, for conversations that need more time, it is best to ask the person to call back at a more convenient time. Cell phones can also cause you to neglect the people you are with. I find it really annoying when my friends constantly check their messages on their phone. In fact, I want to tell them to turn off the cell phone and enjoy my company. Another point that needs to be made has to do with personal space. I think it is very impolite to make calls in small spaces or crowded rooms. This makes others uncomfortable and forces them to listen to your personal conversations. Additionally, it disturbs other face-to-face -face conversations. That's why I never use my cell phone within a few meters of other people, except in emergencies. Lastly, I would like readers to pay attention to the dangers of using your phone while doing something else. For instance, driving and texting is a bad combination. Likewise, using your phone or texting when walking can make you careless. You don't want to get hit by a car. Pay attention to where you're going. The first point I'd like to address is when not to use your phone. The first point I'd like to address 
is when not to use your phone. It's polite to switch off your phone. It's polite to switch off your phone. Or turn off the sound when you're in class or in a meeting. Or turn off the sound when you're in class or in a meeting. If you get an important call. If you get an important call. You should ask for permission to leave the room. You should ask for permission to leave the room. And then, don't talk for too long. And then, don't talk for too long. Furthermore, for conversations that need more time. Furthermore, for conversations that need more time. It is best to ask the person to call back at a more convenient time. It is best to ask the person to call back at a more convenient time. Cell phones can also cause you to neglect the people you are with. Cell phones can also cause you to neglect the people you are with. I find it really annoying when my friends constantly check their messages on their phone. I find it really annoying when my friends constantly check their messages on their phone. In fact, I want to tell them to turn off the cell phone and enjoy my company. In fact, I want to tell them to turn off the cell phone and enjoy my company. Another point that needs to be made has to do with personal space. Another point that needs to be made has to do with personal space. I think it is very impolite to make calls in small spaces or crowded rooms. I think it is very impolite to make calls in small spaces or crowded rooms. This makes others uncomfortable. This makes others uncomfortable. And forces them to listen to your personal conversations. And forces them to listen to your personal conversations. Additionally, it disturbs other face to face conversations. Additionally, it disturbs other face to face conversations. That's why I never use my cell phone within a few meters of other people except in emergencies. That's why I never use my cell phone within a few meters of other people, except in emergencies. Lastly, I would like readers to pay attention to the dangers of using your phone while doing something else. Lastly, I would like readers to pay attention to the dangers of using your phone while doing something else. For instance, driving and texting is a bad combination. For instance, driving and texting is a bad combination. Likewise, 
using your phone or texting when walking can make you careless. Likewise, using your phone or texting when walking can make you careless. You don't want to get hit by a car. You don't want to get hit by a car. Pay attention to where you're going. Pay attention to where you're going. Cell phone etiquette. The first point I'd like to address is when not to use your phone. It's polite to switch off your phone or turn off the sound when you're in class or in a meeting. If you get an important call, you should ask for permission to leave the room and then don't talk for too long. Furthermore, for conversations that need more time, it is best to ask the person to call back at a more convenient time. Cell phones can also cause you to neglect the people you are with. I find it really annoying when my friends constantly check their messages on their phone. In fact, I want to tell them to turn off the cell phone and enjoy my company. Another point that needs to be made has to do with personal space. I think it is very impolite to make calls in small spaces or crowded rooms. This makes others uncomfortable and forces them to listen to your personal conversations. Additionally, it disturbs other face-to-face -face conversations. That's why I never use my cell phone within a few meters of other people except in emergencies. Lastly, I would like readers to pay attention to the dangers of using your phone while doing something else. For instance, driving and texting is a bad combination. Likewise, using your phone or texting when walking can make you careless. You don't want to get hit by a car. Pay attention to where you're going. Cell phone etiquette. The first point I'd like to address is when not to use your phone. It's polite to switch off your phone or turn off the sound when you're in class or in a meeting. If you get an important call, you should ask for permission to leave the room and then don't talk for too long. Furthermore, for conversations that need more time, it is best to ask the person to call back at a more convenient time. Cell phones can also cause you to neglect the people you are with. I find it really annoying when my friends constantly check their messages on their phone. In fact, I want to tell them to turn off the cell phone and enjoy my company. Another point that needs to be made has to do with personal space. I think it is very impolite to make calls in small spaces or crowded rooms. This makes others uncomfortable and forces them to listen to your personal conversations. Additionally, it disturbs other face-to-face -face conversations. That's why I never use my cell phone within a few meters of other people, except in emergencies. Lastly, I would like readers to pay attention to the dangers of using your phone while doing something else. For instance, driving and texting is a bad combination. Likewise, using your phone or texting when walking can make you careless. You don't want to get hit by a car. Pay attention to where you're going.
Listen and practice. Exercise 6. Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city center gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website, and of course any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques.
I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques. and then indicate some of our interim findings. And then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, Two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey. In their own city center gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. In their own city center gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth. We estimated that it was about one-fifth. And this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the Town Land Survey Office, 24% to be precise. And this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the Town Land Survey Office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city.
Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months. ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside. and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? And thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, if you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website. We've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website. And, of course, any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. And, of course, any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species, Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species. Because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole.
The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas. This time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment. This time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment. So hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. So hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all, we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. We had lots of sightings, so all in all, we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens. Because these days, gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Because these days, gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Listen and practice. Good morning. 
Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city center gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well. So much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website. And, of course, any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all, we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that.